the School of Architecture at the University of Texas at Arlington presents Material Matters, a lecture series that examines what matters in the discipline of architecture and what is considered material in the practice of the architect. We couldn't think of a better photograph to start um, the lecture with and to sort of talk a little bit about the core values and the way we practice and things that are important to us. This is, of course, um, the Wright brothers' first flight in North Carolina in the year of 1903. With this image, we want to talk about a few things. One, we believe that good work, for, to do good work, one must take on the liability of being conceptually rigorous in terms of the immaterial, such as in this picture, physics and mathematics, but also the willingness to deal with or even embrace the material. Two, architecture is more interesting as an instrument than an image, an instrument that creates spaces for people to live, work, play, and rest. And number three, we also understand that architecture is the, is, is the long game, meaning it's a marathon. It's not about this project or that project. That, in, in, that ultimately, it is the ultimate project of building a practice or building a theory or building a writing. Sometimes we get off track and perhaps sometimes the material takes over the immaterial or vice versa. You'll see that to stay nimble, we do two things. First, which is really important to both Rizzi and I, and that is to have one foot in academics, teaching our students, discussing issues of the day with our colleagues, and hopefully in person one day, really keeps us nimble. And then the other is, at times we stop what we're doing at the office and we spend an entire weekend doing a competition which we did about three weeks ago. When we talked about this lecture, we, we thought about, um, we took inventory of a time between 1993 and 2000 when Rizzi and I were in school as, an, as undergrads, which we think still was some of the most influential years in our career. And we took inventory of what was going on in architecture at that sort of span of time. And it was amazing to look back and realize that on the left, when I started school, because Rizzi's three years younger than I am, in 1993, that, you know, if you flip through the magazines, you would often see Michael Graves' Portland building. And by the time Rizzi graduated in the year 2000, we were seeing things like the Signal Box by Herzog and Damon, the Church on the Water by Ondo, uh, projects by Foster and um, the beginnings of the Sendai Media Tech in design by Toyoito. And of course, we can name so many others Stephen Hole and Plasma talking about phenomenology. Um, Charles Moore was at the school my first year and passed away my second year. And then we've moved from that to this. And it was an amazing time and a time of transition. So I think this affected us greatly because Rizzi and I are used to being in a time where it was more, where it was a phase where the large dogmas of architecture sort of faded away and it was replaced by a multiplicity of ideas from different regions and different places. And that, is, that has affected our practice and the way we think about our work up to this day. Then we took inventory of all the books that were introduced to us in that span. From In Praise of Shadows and of course, Venturi's great treatise, Complexity and Contradiction in Architecture. And by the time I was in my third year, just about everyone had a copy of Small, Medium, Large and Extra Large on their desk. If you look at the titles of these, even if you haven't delved through each and every one of them, 
we realize that what these books talk about, which also is a reflection of our practice today, are three things, um, culture, value, and context. You can see that Nicholas Negroponte's book, that book was introduced in my last year in school. And that was the year that I got my first email address, that we were starting to arrive to the digital age. And then the last slide for this preface is the places that Rizzi and I worked when we were in school and then when we graduated. On the left there, Rizzi spent a little time at um, OMA, Wim Cool House and his team. And I spent some time at Stanley Sabowitz's office in San Francisco. Those short, those were pivotal moments in our career because not only did it show us how to make buildings, how to create concepts, but also how to create a team and how to run a practice. And of course, when we graduated, we both ended up for many, many years at Gary Cunningham's office locally. And that was, in our eyes, the second part of our education, where we really, really learned how to run an office, how to uh, put buildings together, how tectonics and structure and space all play together. So hopefully, as we talk about the two projects that we will talk about tonight, that you will see some of these influences. Uh, a quick quip, we started with six projects, then we narrowed it down to four. And as hard as it is for architects not to sort of show off all their children, we decided to just stick to two, which is against the grain of most lectures where it's sort of a catalog, we decided that for the students' sake, we would really delve into each project's process. So you really see behind the scenes and all the reasons why we make certain moves the way we make them. Um, so we will start and Rizzi will start with the first project. We, in some ways, kind of consider our work an unfolding story some of it scripted, some of it unscripted, and something that will continue with many chapters hopefully ahead. Today, we will begin to share those beginnings. For us, chapter one, starting today, is going to be on the subject of place and how place is both critical to our process, but also not simply about its standard definition tied to location or uh, simply sort of a surrounding environment. For us, place really expands and begins to be about all of the parameters of a project, inclusive of the individuals, the typology, and how architecture can successfully emerge from those. Like most architects in, in most locations, you know, our early work is within close proximity. And for us, it was also um, even sort of almost that was exaggerated in terms of the scale of the proximity, wherein most of our projects were practically in our black backyard, several with a singular client and a certain set of familiar parameters. In this image here, the uh, orange dot at the upper left is the location of our office and where we spend quite a bit of our time. The uh, demising line down the middle of the image is uh, Highway 75, uh, cutting through the uptown area of Dallas. And the other side of the image on the right is the sort of radical uh, emerging uh, emergence of East Dallas, which is a certain set of uh, parameters and a certain type of context. Primarily, you know, those projects became rooted in finding solutions to urban infill lots, a context, a city, a place with which we were, of course, very familiar, not only because of our proximity, but our, our origins and, and our childhoods. Um, and even the familiarity extended with the majority of these projects, seven 
of those dots and locations were, were done and executed with a singular person in different roles, um, multiple hats and multiple roles that of client, developer, and also contractor. For us, ultimately, that became not only a business relationship, but also a personal relationship and a friendship. And that familiarity of place then extended and would take both of us to a radically different setting. As we shift years, the setting that we migrated to um, with this particular individual was Santa Fe, New Mexico a landscape radically different and a place radically different than where we both began our relationship versus the sort of semi-urbanity and density of Dallas and East Dallas and the uh, extension of sort of a plain, plains of concrete and highways. We both sort of translate transferred to a landscape of completely different parameters, an expansion of the horizon, a system of views, a setting that is much more about nature than it is about the car or the highways or sometimes even the buildings around you. What was interesting about um, this uh, particular individual is that they had, of course, worked with us through many projects and other architects and had uh, worked very closely with an architect to design a house in Dallas. And that was a, as any um, kind of project of that nature, sort of a labor of love and something that really became both their home and very close to their heart and something they felt, you know, really embraced and worked great for the way that they lived. Uh, what is kind of illustrated here is the simplicity of that context, which is a, a lot in the M Streets area of East Dallas, sort of a standard 50 by 150 lot with a house that was split into a series of kind of rectangular volumes nestled into the lot. But the house and those components really, really resonated with that client and how they lived and this individual. And the original premise of the idea was that it should be a very easy exercise and would make them extremely happy to simply, in some ways, recreate this house on a piece of property in New Mexico, in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Now, for us, that became sort of a difficult starting point. Luckily, we had a good friendship, so we could all be very honest and straightforward with one another, and we knew that the process would be able to evolve and unfold in a way, hopefully, that would still bring good architecture. One of the first things that we sort of brought to the agenda from the discussion was the idea that really the importance in the house that they felt was perfect and that they loved and had grown to enjoy so much by living there for many years was that really it was about the way that the individual components were experienced and related to them and how those respond, re components responded to that particular piece of property and that particular place. Now, what was different then was how those components could successfully translate to a different place, one of horizon, one of expansive landscapes, one of a series of views versus just trying to find glimpses of your own manufactured landscape in the backyard or a sort of uh, buffering of yourself from your neighbors rather than a view into the expanse of nature that surrounds you. The argument was that those components could then be heightened if they better responded to their place. Oh, sorry, go back one. And the orange dot here is the site which is a um, site located on a ridge that has the benefit of this view extending out to actually four different mountain ranges. And for us, that began to then establish a hierarchy of a series of axes and a, a, a importance of something that could respond to this sense of place and those 
magnificent views. The axes then became a series of organization and a, a system to organize both the program and to respond to the place. An in-depth study was kind of undertaken to study the possibilities and to rethink and present how those components could more effectively respond to this place and still have the same successful relationship that made the previous house a wonderful place to live. The three axes set up a system of organization that was able, able to be translated into a simple series of three volumes. And each in-depth study of these three volumes almost exhausted the possibilities. Kind of touching back to um, an earlier point in that the client was both an experienced, not only um, client in terms of working with architects, but also in the role of developer and the role of contractor. So had a broader, almost more uh, slightly dangerous uh, sense of knowledge in terms of what they liked, what they thought worked, how things um, were meant to be in terms of the way that they would live and, and, and even be constructed. But what was unique is that we were able to, by the nature of the history of the relationship, have a very honest dialogue to the extent that each of these individual studies became a very resolved floor plan and any one that could have been built and, and been created and, and hopefully still enjoyable, but it was only through the analysis and that exhaustive process over the course of almost months that the most appropriate solution could eventually evolve. And of course, then change during construction a few times as tends to always happen. The solution of the response to these axes set up by the three uh, primary views led to the kind of siting of the house and the orientation of the volumes. An existing, partially existing driveway that sort of nestled and weaves you through the landscape of what is a site that was approximately four times the magnitude of what they experienced in Dallas with the previous house and how that would then further define how it could better respond to its place. The volumes each orient towards a unique view meant to be experienced from a different part of the house at a different time of the day, both responding to the direction, the orientation of the sun, how the individuals that inhabit the house would actually move through the house during different times of the day, and what opportunities that would open up in terms of how they experience it on a daily basis. The volumes then were sort of intentionally set to become a single story and a very low lying volume that's somewhat contradictory to the uh, sort of typical Santa Fe house typology was more about sort of nestling into the landscape surrounding it rather than trying to create another hill or another volume out of the house that would almost sit atop the hill and strive to sort of take advantage of views by being another element within the views themselves. The development of the space and the plan actually led to a strategic dissolution of the volumes, blurring the boundaries and translating those volumes into what became more a series of planes that simply were a structure of grounding certain spaces and the kind of core parts of the house to the site and allowing the volumes to become a little bit more immaterial, which is the introduction of kind of large planes of glass oriented both to the views and to other parts of the experience, be it the sequence of entry or views from internal spaces outward to create something that was really then further grounded to its place and more about living on the land than among it. The low-lying volume sort of extends out in the horizon and simply becomes a almost then a series of horizontal planes of both sort of floor and roof open to the landscape 
beyond. The planes are sort of established in a system of uh, for different porosities, some that sort of buffer privacy, such as kind of the areas that address more direct views towards even distant neighbors and a sense of arrival from the car and a sense of a sequence of entries. The experience of the entry in, in broader kind of parts of the house in terms of the outdoor spaces was for us also a little bit more about trying to bring the building closer to its sense of space of place, but not in the sense of simply being about the way that a certain typology might react to that place or is considered in that place. For example, here, the idea of what is very in a typical kind of Santa Fe house setup with the large parcels of land, the large lots, the experience of outdoor space is the idea of the entry courtyard and something that typically becomes about a sense of separation from your neighbors or the neighborhood or a buffer from the car and a space that tends to be more enclosed. For us, it was about in this typology and to be about the place to sort of reconsider what the qualities of those spaces are and how they're heightened rather than the way that they have been expressed simply in the past. So the translation of that and the redefinition of the court and space was to tie back further to the idea of the house in that the planes and the system that sets into the land then actually can kind of dissolve and actually have a better relationship to the land and the horizon and the views beyond. So rather than a solid masonry or plaster uh, wall defining the courtyard, a series of vertical aluminum slats set strategically on a series of angles allows both a sense of privacy and a sense of enclosure, but also an openness to the environment, the site, and even portions of the views beyond, both from the experience moving from the exterior to the interior of the house, but also from the inside out. Another traditional element that has a critical kind of success and, and place within the Santa Fe typology of the house, which is really about the idea of an outdoor space and the indoor outdoor living that can be taken advantage of. So the idea, the concept of portal is really a sense of the program, which is a space that is utilized for both outdoor living, outdoor dining, experience the, experiencing the outdoors, and the views and the landscape. That space is typically set up by an extension of the roof plane and a series of columns. For us, the idea of grounding the house better to its site and taking advantage of not only the multiple views, but their expanse was the critical nature that the structure and the house should also respond to that. So rather than a simple series of columns to hold the roof, to define the space on the outside. It was a critical kind of analysis and a little bit of press to utilize extended steel elements to create a defining cantilever that would then allow the space to open up freely and merge better both with the landscape and feel that it's a part of the view, extending the inside of the house further out and really blurring the boundary of that transition. This sort of create continues as a theme, bringing that idea of the extension of the landscape, the views out both into the areas and the spaces that house the sort of uh, more core programmatic elements and the sense of sort of shelter within the bedrooms that can be closed off, but also open up extensively to select views of the landscape on the lower image the sense of circulation throughout the house also always extends out to a view and out to the landscape to where the experience of moving through the house is a function of moving through a series of planes rather than the sense of a defined volume. The outdoor space also kind of 
grounds itself to the site, but also re-emphasizes kind of the sense of planes, even the outdoor elements in the portal horizontally sort of hover above the landscape sort of very intentionally so that in certain places on a sense of arrival, the building kind of touches the ground in the areas where the solid elements can anchor themselves. But those areas where the planes dissolve and the areas on the inside can open up to the outside, the building hovers and tends to touch the ground in a much lighter way, perceiving itself as a series of planes and volumes and allowing the inside to extend to the outside. For us, this extension out to the horizon and the nestling of the house into the landscape is something that's truly grounded by its place. So chapter two, we're gonna speak about domesticity. We met our next clients actually via a triplex we did for the owner of the Santa Fe house. This was one of his last projects um, while he was in Dallas before he moved over to Santa Fe. And um, a couple guys who lived in about 400 square feet in Manhattan uh, was moving to Dallas and they basically bought the unit to the left there, the front unit, the corner unit, uh, seeing just the plans and the renderings. And so in this project, we're going to talk about the ideas and the concepts, but we're going to also talk about a few um, sort of side stories that are very interesting. So when we had done, as Rizzi had mentioned, a lot of multifamily work for this developer, um, we talk about context a lot. But context comes in two things. One, in Dallas, it's a very tough subject matter because unlike older cities, you know, when you think of Dallas, you sort of think of um, shopping, you think of um, restaurants, you think of highways, you think of the car. Um, for outsiders, maybe they think of the show Dallas. But in terms of architecture, the disadvantage is there's not something immediate to respond to really uh, in the traditional sense of how we think about context. But the advantage is for the same reason, there is not, not much to respond to. So what we talked about with this developer was that we have so many people moving here from the West and East Coast that perhaps context has a lot to do with the context these people are bringing here in terms of aesthetics and also more importantly, domesticity. And we had discussed doing a black skinned building for a long time with him because as we know in the field, the Japanese and the Europeans have been doing forever. And he just kept telling us the market here would not accept that. But finally we were able to pull this off and um, just by coincidence, the first buyers of the project were from New York. So sometimes context is deceiving. So we're actually not talking about this project. We're using this because we're talking about how we met these clients. We became fast friends. Um, we had dinner in the house. And then they lived here for, I, I believe, close to two years. And so they moved from 400 square feet to 1460. And it was a great study as we built up our working relationship and a friendship with them, how domesticity sort of changed and how they sort of acclimated to Texas in a way. Before we get into that, uh, they bought a lot, which is a triangular lot that we're gonna see in a minute. But we had actually built two houses uh, very close to there. And we're using this as reference. The first one uh, is actually on the same street as they are on Madera Street. And this house on the left started as a speculative single family, but the uh, owner's brother liked it so much that he ended up buying it right after uh, it finished. And the one on the right is actually a sort of almost 80% renovation with a, an addition on the second floor. And that is right around the corner in the back of the lot that we're going to look at. 
So here's the triangular lot on the left side. So there were sort of two happy accidents that happened in, in, this, um, in this project. And, and, the, and we call them happy accidents now because it turned out okay, but at the time it was uh, quite stressful. Um, so you can see the two streets. The top street is a Madeira and the bottom is Colon. And uh, you see the property line. And then of course the gray stuff is the setback and the, and the white piece is um, the buildable area. So we thought. But when we went out to see the site, there's a thing that the city calls block phase continuity, which means you have to match the setback of all the buildings that run along the same street. Um, even if your setback is not that deep. Well, when we went out there, obviously none of the buildings were following any block phase continuity. In fact, some of them were protruded further than the setback even allowed. And uh, we assumed if it didn't exist in reality that then it didn't exist in the code. Well, we have since learned that is not true. That even if your neighbors are doing something wrong, you must follow the code. And in fact, that code would have us set the house back 20 feet from that sort of angled property line on the top, uh, which then would mean we have very little buildable area. Our only choice was to go for a variance, which took six months and a lot of documentation. Our clients were very patient. And looking back, honestly, if we had followed the rules from the beginning, this would have been a two-story house, a very different house than what they asked for. When they bought this lot, they wanted a little more square footage. They wanted a very usable yard with a pool. So that's how the sort of domesticity changed. They wanted a one-story house also. So on the right side, you see, and we showed that image because obviously we won the variance. We were able to put a fence and, and extend the two wings so the, the house very simply organized into two wings. The one on the bottom um, is the sort of great room and go garage, and you can see the entry there with the arrow. And the light gray is all the uh, bedroom wing. And then in between, we close the triangle as a sort of um, interior courtyard with the pool. Something we want to talk about here uh, between this and Santa Fe is that, you know, we're more urban here, it's in the city. And in terms of domesticity, we found that with other clients also that when you're in the city, there's an idea that you want to be stewards of their land in, the, in your property. And to do that, there is some notion that one must close up at least partly the lot and to sort of uh, have some sort of privacy and some sort of boundary. And this worked really well because we not only is it a triangular lot, it's at the end of the street two streets that converge. So we close the triangle by enclosing the, the interior courtyard. Here's the plan. Uh, like we said before, um, very simply organized, two linear things that converge and the joint becomes where the two car garage is and right to the left of that is a sort of recess niche for the entry. This is a section cutting through the uh, great room wing where you can see the elevation of the bedrooms beyond. And you can see that there's two shed roofs that come together and the bedroom wing slightly comes under the roof of the uh, living room wing. We wanna talk about a little bit um, happy accident number two. The gentleman on the left there is grinding the concrete because when they poured, um, it was in the fall and the twigs and the trees were falling onto the concrete and it created this pattern of twigs. And the first thing we were going to do was grind it and diamond grind it. So you see this beautiful aggregate, but hopefully the grind would then take off the indentions of the, of the twigs. But what we didn't realize is some of the twigs were very deep, so we just couldn't keep grinding. And we'll, we'll talk about the solution when we see the interior images. So the diamond grind process didn't work. On the right side, it's just a, a, an image of during construction where it's obviously just a light frame wood construction. Um, it's very uh, 
the idea in our office is sometimes you take very regimented and very modular things and make them hopefully somewhat extraordinary. We take a lot of these pictures because it's the one of the few times in the last times we'll ever see the building this way, to see the bones that way, and that's really important to us. So here's the finished product. Um, it's probably one of the best lawns I've ever seen. Some people have uh, commented on our Instagram that that may not be real grass. Um, but it's that sort of domestic idea that one takes care of the property that you own. And I know that um, our clients, Brandon and Jeff, really take a lot of time to take care of that lawn and those trees. But this is, uh, once again, the same material that was clad. It's a, it's a ribbed metal siding in black that's clad in the, um, in the triplex that they lived in. So we were staying with the same theme, but this time a very low-lying sort of roof, um, very general to the context of the neighbors. Um, what's funny about this too is we tell our students this. Um, in Dallas, where sometimes uh, the context is everywhere, that if you want to blend in, if you just get the scale of the building right, that's, that's almost 80% of it. And um, that's what we try to do here. This is one during dusk. This is a shot taking from where the two streets converge. And um, there's a dark stained wood fence um, installed vertical to run parallel to the ribs. And here's a somewhat aerial shot, so you can kind of see the shape of the building. And that's just really a charcoal colored asphalt shingle roof. This is the front door. So from this angle, you can't see that the roof is even shed. The idea with the landscape was that um, with this sort of taut, almost stealth-like um, machine, the landscape and the pavers would be sort of very irregular and very organic in a sense. And you'll see that in the interior courtyard also. And just like the Santa Fe house, we don't have as much space as that site, but um, we really believe in a mediating space be between the outdoors and the indoors, especially in the summers here. Um, the idea that there's a microclimate even if it's very narrow before you come in the house. So you're not going from your car, which is probably 70 degrees to 100 degrees, and then right back to a seven degree house that there's something in between. And that's very important to us. This house, this is the entry when you first come in. This house, to these guys, it's a house for living in and their two dogs, but also a house for art. And what's funny about how things come about if you really dig in and design things is that when this was under construction and when it was near completion, you know, a lot of the neighbors who walk by every day, they don't realize how much art is in this place, but it must have shown through on the exterior because this house was sort of nicknamed by the neighbors, the museum house in the neighborhood. So something about the exterior read as a gallery. And in fact, in the interior, it was somewhat of a gallery. If you turn left, then you go into the great room, the kitchen um, right next to you, and you can see the white flooring. That is actually a thin set white concrete floor. Um, what we did when the diamond grind didn't work, um, the clients got together with us and decided we have a black exterior house. We're going to do black no work. How about if we're going to pour a thin set concrete to cover up the um, twig indentions, how about we do it in smooth white? And that's what we ended up with. So it's a, it's a really stunning sort of floor when you first see it, especially in person. This is um, an image of the big piece of art that they got, right? And that fits perfectly in between those windows there. And this is of course standing where the image was looking right back 
at the foyer to the left. And that's a 16 foot uh, pocket sliding glass door that opens up into the courtyard. This is a straight shot looking right back at the kitchen. And the, the, the nice thing about the, the L-shaped linear two wing house is that in each of the wings, you see the other wing through the, through the windows. This is the master bedroom, which has a big window also looking right back out into the courtyard. And we like to show this because um, part of the idea of domesticity for us too is that we wanna celebrate spaces that people sometimes overlook. This is the master bath with the skylight that shines down on the big piece of a tile and on the, on the sort of freestanding tub. That the idea that brushing your teeth and cleaning yourself is almost celebrated and is almost ceremonial is very important to us. This is during dusk when the um, sliders are open. And uh, like we spoke before, the, um, the pavers, the stone pavers become very organic. So it, it's that sort of tension between that and the uh, hotness of the house. And this is looking right back at the sliders from the end of the pool. And so you may think that the story ends here. But Brandon and Jeff is as restless as Rizzy and I. And so they decided that perhaps we do a sort of cousin to this in Broken Bow, um, Oklahoma, where there's a development um, called Woodland Hills, where they bought a lot in the woods and decided to do a weekend house that they would then rent out when they're not using as like an Airbnb. Oh, before I go there, my apologies. I wanted to show the aerial of this. Usually we don't show aerials because that's not how you see architecture, but it was just funny to see an aerial of this because it was almost exactly like our site plan. It's amazing from this distance that they actually built what we draw. And this shows you a little bit of the context of the, um, of the surroundings. And you can see how we kind of completed the triangle with that uh, fence. So here we are in Broken Bow. There's Jeff there. This is when we covered, uh, this is a beautiful wooded site. And this is where uh, they covered up the form boards because uh, it was raining and we were out there checking and measuring. And uh, that picture there on the right was taken last weekend when we were there. Once again, a linear, very long, long house. There it is when you drive up, linear house with a huge deck. And we wanted to show this because it's very interesting and we really haven't even brought this up with Brandon and Jeff is that, you know, the spaces in the triplex that they lived in were somewhat linear. Then the Cohen residence were two linear rectangles that converged at a corner. And then this house is one long, long sort of shotgun house with a sort of enclosed courtyard, covered courtyard in the middle. And this is their weekend house. What you don't know is that they also bought another lot recently there. And that one they don't talk about as their weekend house. And we're, we're in the midst of designing that one. And for the first time, that one is actually two squares offset. And we sort of wonder, and maybe it's a good conversation over dinner one day, has the sort of idea of living changed from linearity to square-like forms? Or is it because their lifestyle is still fitting in a linear form? It's just this next one is not one that they really consider a house they would spend too much time on. So this idea that um, the domesticity of say Santa Fe and this, the idea of place, the idea of context 
it's quite nebulous because in some ways we grew with Brandon and Jeff in Dallas together because that was not a landscape they understood or knew about when they first moved here. And now it's taken us all the way to uh, Oklahoma in the woods. Santa Fe was similar. We started doing speculative um, duplexes and triplexes with the owner Santa Fe. And then we moved with him to Santa Fe from Dallas. And he had to learn about the, the context and we had to learn about the context. But then there's all the baggage that we brought with us, all the sort of tight fitting infill housing that we did with him. Um, and then our experience living in Dallas and then all the experience he had living elsewhere before he moved to Dallas, all that came together. And we think that that's what makes projects very, very interesting. They're not easy to do, but at the end of the day, it, it really shows up in the projects. Really our last slide is a continuation. This is a beautiful uh, little master plan and uh, ranch complex that um, we're doing and are continuing to do. And that was going to be our third project, which we decided to focus just on two tonight, but that was gonna be on the subject of immersion. But hopefully we can uh, reconvene at another time. Thank you.